Yeah, you can imagine how revolutionary this would mm -hmm. be to come right up to the lens like that. Yeah. That, that would never have been done before. I mean, you know, what Marty always says is D.W. Griffiths and all these people did it all long before us. And right. <laughs> and it's true. It's all it's been true. done. It's true. It's all been done. Oh, that's great. Oh, it's see, that, actually, is, it's really nice. Yeah. Yeah. You see, and this is where we come in after they've hidden, and now they're going to come in again from right. screen right. Okay, well, let's try the narration over. That's beautiful. Okay. Right now, I'm uh, supervising a documentary Marty's making about the centenary of film because in 1995 is the hundred years since film was first invented and of course every country is fighting over who invented it but uh, the British Film Institute and Channel 4 are doing a program which will uh, have one director in each country give his own personal vision of what his country's cinema was and Scorsese is doing it for America Stephen Frears is doing it for uh, Britain Bertolucci is doing it for Italy and so forth and so I'm, I'm working on that right now and what is your uh, conclusion after 100 years of film? <laughs> oh, well, Marty is doing his as a very personal vision of the films that influenced him as a filmmaker. So he's, he's covering only those films, really, and actually they're often not the most famous films. They're not Gone with the Wind. They're often what were called B-films in Hollywood. Uh, very interesting directors who were subversively uh, introducing certain themes and camera styles and uh, filmmaking styles that were innovative but working within the studio system. So these are the films that actually influenced him more than some of the major films that most people know about and that's what he's trying to do, give people an idea of how these films that were not at the time particularly considered highly were deeply influential to him. He's a great historian of film. He knows so much about it and, and studies films all the time because they fuel him, they refresh him, they, uh, they, they inspire him. And it's not necessarily a direct inspiration. He may see a shot and then he takes it into himself and then it comes out in his own way in some other shot of his own. Really See, this idea. shot is um, so important <clears throat> in Goodfellas, you know, remember where this great, this great train where he shot and Joe Pesci fires into the lens like this. Oh, you this mean shot. the shot here? This shot, mean. yeah. The, the, you remember the end of, uh, of Goodfellas where he right, fires? Well, you know, it's all, it's directly yeah, influenced by genres. the shot from Great Train Run. Uh -huh. And he had Joe Pesci yeah. do exactly, <laughs> even with a, he had Joe even Pesci with, with a hat on, yeah. <laughs> Uh, he goes home at night and watches at least one film, sometimes two films every night, old films usually, that he threads up on his 16 millimeter projector and rewinds and uh, because he just is constantly studying the way a painter would go into a museum and, and study the work of the people who had gone before him. He's always studying it to learn and to be inspired and, and to be refueled. I've known him since he was in his last year at the University of New York University and worked with him then on his major feature film, his first feature film called Who's That Knocking? Uh, so I edited that with him. But we had been working in, together on documentaries um, about the war in Vietnam and supporting uh, uh, Martin Luther King, who was uh, trying to integrate the South, things like that. It was a very exciting time. We were very politically, ide uh, I, I, so we were idealistic is the word. We were very politically idealistic and it was a wonderful time being in the streets of New York with a very small group of friends with whom we made films. He and I were the supervising editors on Woodstock and then he left early to go to uh, Hollywood to bust in there. Um, but that documentary style has, has affected uh, our work very much. Our, our interest in editing is, is very much affected by documentaries and by the work of the great documentarians like uh, Leacock and Penny Baker and the Maisels affected us very much. In what, in what way? We like um, a certain roughness sometimes in uh, the film editing style that maybe a Hollywood editor wouldn't like. Hollywood editors tend to like a slick style of editing where all the bumps are removed. But sometimes Marty and I like to keep in those bumps because they add a certain grittiness to the film, a certain reality. Or we like maybe to shock the audience with a cut they're not expecting, which will refresh them and make them look at something in a new way instead of letting them glide through the film, which is the way some Hollywood editors like things to be. They don't want uh, the audience to notice the editing. Uh, whereas we like the audience sometimes to notice the editing. Sometimes you don't in an intense dialogue scene. You want things to flow so that the audience isn't thinking about the cuts. But there are the times when you want them to think about the editing or be affected by it. There's a scene in Goodfellas, for example, where the uh, uh, 
the marriage scene, and it's a Jewish wedding, and in the Jewish wedding they break a, a glass under the, the, the groom breaks a glass under, under his foot as part of the symbolism of the, of the wedding. And we, the way we cut that, if you look at that sequence, you'll see it's very jaggedly cut. It's a very odd way we did it in order to uh, accentuate the violence of the breaking of the glass. And it, it's, it, it's sort of jumped. The cut is not a traditional cut. It's jumped to make, to increase the feeling of jaggedness. If it was cut by a Hollywood editor, it probably everything would have matched, you know, everything would have come into the frame, exited one frame, come into another frame, whereas we forcibly made what was some people would consider an orthodox cut or a bad cut. Some people might consider it a bad cut, but we like that kind of thing. <laughs> My director is a wonderful editing director, but some editors get very angry and frustrated because they're working with a director who doesn't know how to shoot a film to make it edit properly, and they then have to come in and try and save the film. So a lot of editors in Hollywood sometimes get very frustrated and angry uh, and feel they don't get enough credit. I'm in the reverse position. I work for a director who has a fantastic sense of editing. He, editing is his favorite thing in filmmaking. He's often said he edited his uh, several of his early films himself. He edited Mean Streets himself, for example, although there's another editor credited. They had to say that, but he edited it himself. Um, and he thinks like an editor when he conceives a film. He has a different editing style in mind for each film. He thinks like an editor when he's writing, co-writing it, when he's shooting it. And certainly then he comes into the editing room and directs the editing. We do it all together. And so I am blessed by having a director who actually is doing 50% of my work in the way he is conceiving it and laying it down on film so that when we get in the editing room, it's, uh, it's got a conception, it's got a, a vision. Yeah. Is it why you work exclusively for him? That because you, you don't work for any other director, isn't it? Right, yeah, I love working for Marty. I, I, I personally think he's the best director working today. So I, I am very lucky to, to have this relationship with him, which I hope will continue. Um, I just find him so interesting. Every film, he sets himself a new challenge. He sets himself a, a, an experiment or a problem he wants to solve. Can I do this? Can I push the boundaries of filmmaking this way? And that means that I'm learning and being stretched with him on each film. Each film has a new thing we're exploring. Because films are costing so much money, uh, it's becoming more and more difficult for the studios to take the gamble on a film that is dangerous or experimental. And of course, all of Marty's films are like that. So uh, it, it becomes harder and harder for him to sell the idea to the studios. And we have to bear more responsibility uh, for these large budgets. You can't just say, oh, well, I don't care if it makes money when you make a film that costs millions. You have to be uh, more responsible. So it, it's very, di you have to learn, and he's really been able to do it so far, to walk that tightrope between commerce and art, the old battle of all filmmakers, which has been going on since the beginning of film. Uh, and some people think that someone like Scorsese wouldn't have those problems, but he does. And uh, I try and tell young filmmakers, don't be disheartened if you're having the same problem, because he is too. So just take heart. It's part, it's part of living in this industry. You have to learn to fight those battles and try and know where you can compromise and where not. Uh, and understand and respect the people who are giving you the money. But, you know, it, it, it will go on forever, so don't ever think it's going to stop. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and how much experimenting can you still do? Um, it... Well, so far we've been able to get away with some things. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's, it's a it's an minute-to-minute uh, battle, you know, so we'll, we'll see what the next one is what we get away with in the next one. And what, what, what was it in The Age of Innocence? What, what, what was the challenge for you? What was the new thing in that mm -hmm. film? The challenge in The Age of Innocence was to make a film in which people are speaking in period dialogue uh, about, a, about uh, frustration, the frustration of love, about um, people feeling trapped in a society uh, where, which won't let them do what they want, what their hearts are telling them to do. And it's a very subtle film. The, uh, everything is going on with little kind of flickers in, in actors' faces because they're saying one thing and meaning another. And it was very important for us to learn how to get that onto film, how to edit the film, how to slow down the pace from what our normal pace would be so that we could uh, 
get allow the actress to, that that feeling to come through from what they really were meaning instead of what they were saying may i tell you what most interests me about new york not all the blind obeying of tradition somebody else's tradition it seems stupid to have discovered america only to make it a copy of another country do you suppose christopher columbus would have taken all that trouble just to go to the opera with larry lafitz <laughs> Well, I think if you'd suspected that Lefferts were here at the Santa Maria, might never have left port. <laughs> and, and May, does she share these views? Or oh, if she does, she'd never say so. Are you very much in love with her? As much as a man can be. Do you think there's a limit? If there is, I haven't found it. In Age of Innocence, there really is a lovely shot romance, in which uh, Ellen, Countess Olenska, is uh, decides to get up and walk across the room to talk to uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. Now, in New York society at that time, that was considered uh, something you did not do. It was considered very brazen. And she does not realize at the moment that she is doing this, that she is actually uh, doing something which is going to make her considered uh, an outsider in that society. So Marty wanted to emphasize this dramatic moment. And what happens is, if you look at the clip, that she gets up in normal speed. And as the camera dollies back, staying with her in a medium shot, the camera slows down to slow speed. And she, you, you just feel this slightly. You don't, you know, you're not really that aware of what's going on, but you feel something. It slows down uh, to, to slow speed. And then as she gets over, the camera pans over, and as she gets over to uh, Newland Archer, played by Daniel Day-Lewis, it's back to normal speed again. What it does is it gives you that wonderful emphasis of this terrible moment in which she is doing something she doesn't realize is wrong. And you hear over it the narrator, Joanne Woodward, saying, it was not the custom in New York drawing rooms for a lady to get up and walk away from one gentleman in order to seek the company of another. But the Countess did not observe this rule. on the film from the very first day of shooting because my most important time with him is when he looks at his dailies every night after he's through shooting he comes and looks at the film he shot the day before and he has a wonderful immediacy he has a way of reacting to the footage for the first time that he sees it that is is very honest uh, he doesn't protect himself he reacts to it exactly as it looks on the screen which is the key thing because we will never ever get that freshness again he and I we ran out of cable and track. We only have so many times around, so. Oh, I can't believe that. Oh. We have, okay, okay, that was pretty good. So I take very careful notes of what he feels about the acting and the camera work and all at that time. Based on those notes, I then start assembling the film in a very complicated way with his preferred camera move first, his, his second preferred next, his third preferred, and so forth. That way I carve out a lot of the footage that we will never have to look at again. I organize it in a very highly structured way with careful notes, the acting, what, what was the best reading of that particular phrase, the second best, the third best, so that when he's through shooting and he comes into the editing room, we then take all of that footage and start working together to make the first cut. And, but it means that, his, that we have everything in a, in a really organized way that we can look at quickly and say, well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe the third take is better. Uh, and then we start cutting it together. We discuss the scene. He'll go away maybe for a day or two days, depending on how long it takes me to cut it the first time. Then he comes back in. And as we get closer and closer to the fine cut, he's more and more in the room with me because the decisions are very immediate. You know, we're constantly saying to each other, what do you think, is this better or is that better? Every, you know, three or four times in a minute, sometimes we can be talking about things like that. He and I often disagree about things, but we've never had a... a We've never gotten to a situation where we didn't resolve it one way or the other. We screen it one way, and then we screen it another way, and usually one of us sees that the other person is right. Marty's very, very good that way. He'll uh, 
see if something he dreamed of isn't working out or uh, we have to go another way with a conception. He's, he's extremely good about that. He's very tough on himself. And um, so we never get into a situation where it's, it's a war. A lot of director-editor relationships are that way, and it's very, very painful. I've been in those situations, and it's terrible when two people have entirely different ideas about how a film should be made. It's awful. Uh, it's very bloody. And I'm never in that situation with him. Also, we've worked together for so long. It's been almost 30 years <laughs> that uh, I almost know sometimes what he wants before he does. So. What do you think makes the, the American way of storytelling makes so universal that it's understood all over the world? Do you have an idea about that? I suppose that in America we have a very strong idea about narrative filmmaking, which is that we like a story. We like a story to be understandable from the beginning to the end. One of the things that amazed me when I went to Russia, I worked in Russia on a film, uh, was that they didn't care at all about narrative structure. I mean, they, they, they didn't care if anything was explained in the plot. Other things interested them more. And that was quite revealing to me. And I think this is actually true in many cultures. Uh, it's also true in music. I know working with Peter Gabriel, he said that harmony is not such a major thing in other cultures. You know, It's only a minor thing for them. They, they're not interested in it. For us, harmony becomes a huge thing. But in all of the wonderful music that Peter Gabriel has brought to people's consciousness, um, that sort of thing is the is the least important thing and that that also was very revealing to me so i think american maybe the reason that american films appeal so much everywhere is because they tell a very good story i think so anyway maybe i'm wrong it's not a way of editing or so which has something to do with that i think our speed of editing in america is much faster than other filmmakers uh, around the world we we have a much faster pace maybe that makes it more entertaining maybe that makes it more accessible to a, a wide audience also i think we tend to use a clo the close up more uh i know film french filmmakers for example often use wider shots or medium two shots as opposed to close ups uh it's it's just a different style i mean it's fascinating. I, I love the fact that there are so many different styles, but I do think that maybe is one of the reasons.